we're close to being online. So we're online, we'll open the bridge, and then you know, probably open up open topic on recent B-Sides events, conferences, but then cover into like if there's any interesting talks that folks sat in on, you know, anything notable that folks might want to kind of go back to and revisit. So a lot of those are available online, which is awesome. And then, of course, upcoming security conferences. If there's anything. Eric, you went to B-Sides Augusta, right? No. I was oh, that's right, you slept in. I slept in right past my did, alarm. Didn't somebody? Yeah, better than I did. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. So you can tell us about that. Sure, I regret it too. I'm like texting Ben. He's so like, I'm in line con. And I'm like, <laughs> I should be in line con. <laughs> yeah. Snook up on me. I just lost track of time. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a ticket, so it wasn't on my radar until like Monday. You know, so it was already kind of like the rough planning. 450 is what they limited the attendance to this year. But which I, was, my guess about that, I was like, it felt like 2019. Like there were some masks and stuff around, but it well, felt like yeah, 2019. Yeah, yeah, it, it was very much. It was, it was very much so. It was what, like 2,000? 2,000? Yeah. It was packed. But yeah. the flow and everything yeah. still felt like 2019. Yeah, it did. It did. Well, see, though, so the problem this year that they had was because of that construction on the back side of Area 1. You couldn't flow all the way around. So everything was kind of stuck into small spaces. Mm -hmm. And so you, one of the things we had to discuss was, okay, how are we going to get people to flow into, sup, into lunch, eat, and then get back out without there being this continued cross log jam? Because yeah. you couldn't like go Jenna, around. Like walked all the way up to the, realizing the, there's a whole giant tarp blocking off the walkway. And then we yeah. just had to go back. But. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's been a problem they've historically had down there is they don't do a very good job of putting up signage outside of, hey, you're here at this thing, follow these signs to get over to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And so you walk up on the wrong side of the building and find out you've got to go all the way around, but it's blocked by construction. And it's so an you amazing can't. building. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's, if we had that in Greece, cool. holy smokes. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. It is, it is a beautiful setup that they have down there. So when they have higher attendance, the do they have more tracks or just more people in each each track? No, the track count is pretty much exactly the same. Yeah. You just have bigger groups in them. Um, in 2019, they had 970 something people in mm -hmm. 2019 that were there for the conference. And it was a madhouse. It really felt yeah, like that. Bad. Again, so they they were putting out these fancy badges trying to keep up with um, the big DEF CON out in Las Vegas. So we're putting out these badges. We only bought half, they only bought half the parts for building badges. So everybody's getting a badge and everybody's trying to go over and get parts. And the boxes of parts disappeared in like the first half hour. No so it was, you know, and then of course everybody's bothered because. All these people were signing up for the slots, slots to go upstairs to build their badge, and they hadn't even gone over and gotten a box of parts yet. Well, by the time they figured out they needed parts, they went to get a box of parts, and there were no parts left because everybody else had picked up the boxes of parts and not built it. So there were some issues, and that's why this year the badges were much more minimal than what they were. You only actually ended up putting – so the leaf piece that pulls off, yeah. is the only thing this year that you put parts on. Um, last year it was a binary, I mean 2019 it was a binary clock build that had our Arduino so controller. Like how long did it take them on average to get through that? We still were able to have them all build it at 45 minutes apiece. Holy smokes. Each session was still 45 minutes in 2019. So and you, know, you only need the hours, you're good. So, well, so again though, it was, it was still pretty simplistic. The hardest part, the hardest part then was the number of LEDs yeah. that you were putting on it. Because if I remember right, I think yeah. you had like 20 LEDs. And these all came well, those are surface right. mounts, surface yeah. Mount, yeah. So there's no way you could have taught somebody how to surface mount no. components yeah. um, in a 45 minute class. It's hard enough to teach them how to solder. Surface mount, you'd burn the components up by the time half of them would have figured out what was going on. Um, so these guys preloaded all the surface mount stuff, so you had the resistor pass the resistors and the LEDs on the bottom piece. 
So you were just putting the socket in and building the top piece. So you only had, to this year, you only had what? 14 components, 10 components, 12 components, something like that to put in place, yeah. wasn't bad. The thing I learned, uh, this B-sides, was uh, soldering. I put together the badge. Mm. I'd never done that before. So in 2019, I got the badge, but I didn't get the kit. And then I didn't get the time slot, because once everybody realized they were doing badge building at B-sides, was that the first time they did to build the badge? It was, was, and it was the first time doing it, and so they bought kits for half the badges. This is going to be interesting. And in so it was, you know, because they were like, well, we only have so many slots to do badges in, so we're only going to order so many kits for the badges. But then they opened the slots up to anybody who oh, wanted to sign up for it. So we had people coming up to the soldering thing and didn't have any parts. Because they hadn't bought the parts, but they'd signed up and filled in all the slots. <laughs> so, you guys that, but so. I mean, it was pretty fun. And it's a cool company. I mean, that's the yeah. one thing that's this it's this American. company is this company is really neat. They're out of Augusta, Georgia. They you can you can give them a schematic, give them the design, they'll build the whole board for you. They'll preload parts or send you the kits to put your own parts in it. You know, they have a whole bunch of educational things. So, like, if you work with an organization with, with kids or something, you want to introduce them to it, they'll come up with all the equipment, and they'll set up a lab, and they'll teach people how to go through and solder and how to, you know, put in parts, kind of explain parts if you want it, you know, whatever. Badge in 2019 was actually a, uh, a mini Arduino controller because you, you could go in there so it had a programmed pattern and it counted down a clock using binary so your LEDs were giving you binary indicators and you were getting a clock from that but you could plug in a regular Arduino controller and you could reprogram the chip to make it ultimately be do whatever you wanted to with it so it was really kind of a cool cool system that they did last time meant to bring in, I have a Sega Nomad, so I do retro games, reference all too many hobbies. <laughs> um, it was a little over a year ago, but that was the primer for me to brush up on soldering skills. But a Sega Nomad is basically a Sega Genesis that Sega released back in the, like 98, 99. Some good titles. And it was only alive for like 18 months before they yanked it, but it was a handheld Sega Genesis is what it was. So it took the full carts and everything. But the screen on it was one of the first gen LCDs, so it was shot. The speaker in it was shot. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I found online that someone found a way that you could use USB power instead of, you know, you remember back then if you had a game gear, like how long would those batteries last you? Like 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. And there were double A's, right? Yeah, six oh, yeah. of them. Like six double A batteries. So someone figured out that you could bring power in through the AV out. And run it over five volts, which means you can do a USB battery. So I, I 3D printed like a, a battery pack for the back, and then brought that in through the AV port. But lo and behold, I had to figure out how to jump that five volt signal past the 12 volts that the display wanted, because I replaced that. So it just tied into the solder on one project. So I'm going to bring that in. I'll try to do that like next time because it's neat. Can you just pull one of your projects off the shelf? You haven't touched it in like 18 minutes. I play it. I mean, you know, you grab a Sega Genesis. I mean, you don't think about it, but you can play any Sega Genesis title in your hands, like on a. That's cool. That's, that's cool. cool. Ultra Beast. Yep. Shining Force. Yeah. Yeah. She was telling up my help build them. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was in the soldering. I worked. I volunteered up in the soldering area. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. Like they gave out actually uh, oh, B-sides and guns for this past weekend. Oh. That's super cool. and if you were privileged mm -hmm. enough to sign up and get a slot, yeah, you could uh, you could go upstairs and the dude had all the stations set up and mm -hmm. he would and people there to watch over and help and you know give you give you give you instruction and teach you how to use a soldering iron and not kill yourself. After the five minute safety lesson, because I don't know whether it was the college that required him to do it, but yes, like, it was. Was it solder burns at 700 degrees and it yes. goes straight through your eyeball? Yes. <laughs> which, which, I'm sorry, I laughed at the whole thing because, I mean, I've soldered all my life. And 
the thing that's going to hurt you more than anything is a soldering iron. Because yeah, if you take hand, a, if you yeah. take and melt the solder and drop it on your hand, it will cool down before it'll leave a burn. It, it just it, you know it's it's a it's a I tin base. It. It's a tin base, and so it does not retain heat for very long. So I had to laugh when he's like, "It'll go straight through your eye and into your brain." <laughs> Anyway, I ain't gonna say anything. Oh yes, and that was because the wow. university. This was a medical university, yeah. and so the doctors had to have their hands in this thing. You think they'd just be lined up, scrubbed in, ready to go? Like, you were, you're almost, yeah, don't you're almost waiting. Just, you know, just lay on the table. First solid. aid state, you know, solder burn first aid station right outside with people set up. Yeah. That'd give them uh, practice for the med students. Yeah. 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 You know, if you haven't it's been it's burned by a soldering iron, you just have the. Yeah. I, I don't understand yeah. Yeah. Right. And you got to spit on them. That's just yeah. so much fun. You got the smell. Like pull the hair off. Yeah. Oh, the smell. Yeah. 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 It won't, it won't melt solder. Mm. It won't melt solder, but it'll start tables on fire. It'll, you know, all kinds of other wonderful things. Yeah. I guess I have to get burned by solder. You haven't lived. I haven't lived. <laughs> and you don't have to have a friend to help you. you you just do it yourself. <laughs> just a matter of time. Go, go buy one. Don't read the instruction no. manual. <laughs> figure it out. Plug it in and pick it up. Yeah. And you'll kind of figure out pretty quickly whether you did it the correct way or not. Then I'll do it. So, so as Eric will tell you, one of the things that troubleshooting tech uh, electronics helps you with is helps you build that pathway of finding out how am I going to go after this problem. You kind of figure out, okay, hey, we need to start here and work our way through it, eliminating issues as you go through. And it's the same thing we do whether we're doing pen testing, whether you're doing blue teaming, whether you're, I'm doing my GRC. We're trying to, you know, find out what's going to give me the best, you know, what can I get rid of the most of here? Hey, I'm going to do this thing and it's going to get rid of 50% of my problems. I'd rather focus on that than the thing that's going to do 5% of my problems right now. And that's basically on electronics. Once you kind of understand how stuff works, you can get in there and you can eliminate big percentages just by certain, you know, certain pathways. And while you maybe don't come away with, hey, I fully understand how this computer works and how all the signals work and how all the buses work and all that other stuff. It's that, okay, this is just an electronic device. So when it doesn't want to boot up, where do I start out? What what's a process that I can go through to try to troubleshoot and figure out where my problem is as to why it's not working? My my interest is kind of back in like how can you apply like hardware manipulation towards yes. you know bypass techniques? Because yeah. you have a badge access that's it, you know oh, yeah, the easiest love, thing I'm thinking of right now. The theory of the badge access, you know. I, even earlier today, like Talked about how did I get it through the door? I did the John Connor after he broke out my little netbook here, tapped it in, and had it crack the code. And after the dial-up sound finished. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> but you look at it more at technology that is accessible to us. You know how much you know these Echo Dots or like IoT devices that, yeah, like it's coming around that there is like pressure from Gov, but other areas to enforce some security measures on these devices. But at the same time. Like how strong are some of them, and what can you do when you really crack open the case and start looking under the hood and apply both the duality of understanding of electronic components and understanding of like firmware OSs, like super, like a lot of them are running yeah. super trimmed down, yeah. purpose built Linux distros or BSD distros. What can you do when you apply both skill sets? To those I saw a talk, uh, I was a couple of years ago, so I don't remember the details, but they had a a chip of some kind, I don't remember what it was supposed to do, and they hacked it by putting it on a, on a table and shooting it with a laser. Yeah. And they specifically timed the laser to like do a bit flip at a certain point in the algorithm. And so like, they could track where it was and it was like sort of yeah. pulsing the laser at it to get a bit flip, and then that was like when it was doing the password check or whatever. And then it would I forget the term for it, but there's an anomaly that can take place where the only attributing factor they have for it is like dual spatial uh, influence or manipulation radiation. of electronic yeah. yeah radiation. Oh, that's a real problem. We that was like something that we actually considered and designed around when we was working in avionics. Uh, 
the airplanes are exposed to that. Right. So the circuits and yeah. uh, they've got more like, random errors in memory and stuff. But you'll find, like in your, your home router equipment, like they can and will like contribute be like, oh, this is so rare fluke, we're going to account it to that explanation that that bit flipped. Yeah. Or they just want someone to blame. Yeah. <laughs> and the idea, to yeah. But the idea that you could use something like a laser, yeah. that's cool. Um, to me, that fits into the Dane camp of like some of the, the talks around understanding what a CPU is processing based on the sound signature that it gives off or data communications through just regular lights. You know, like you're in the R&D or you're in the education system with a lot of that stuff. That or you work for the government, you're doing top secret NSA work. But, Power cycles. Yeah, but I mean a lot of them leave theory and get into reality where you are communicating, it's just a physical medium, whether it's physical to I or not, we used IR for still today, but for a long time, like it, in the 90s, uh, the infrared type gear, like first wireless devices were predominantly. I mean, you could consider most like timing attacks kind of in the yeah. same category. Like yeah. your, that attack is based on like, the cache architecture and everything to detect whatever you're trying to get. I still don't know how that, whatever the, that hammer Oh, row hammering. Row hammering. Bro hammering. I still don't know what to take. Yeah, I do have, there were a couple, I took some notes from the different sessions that I went through, and Mark Baggett. Awesome. Yeah. Had uh, three tools for threat hunting, and he was just flying through the tools, like just throwing up as much as he could on the screen and just running through them. I'll summarize it and drop it. So do the talk. Sure. He's a SANS instructor. Okay. I think it's... What in target? Sands. Sands. Sands Institute, the bridge version. Most expensive place you can get <laughs> the most awesome training yeah. you can pay for. It. Yeah. It's, it's super expensive. Annual numbers. I can't, I can't think of it. Yeah, I think it's English. But when given an opportunity of feast or famine and DOD dollars are at your doorstep, <laughs> and Sands charges what they charge, purely based, you know, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. They have government contracts. Like they, they have a constant stream. That check is being paid, so they have no reason to make. So, what are the other? So, my note for this next session that I took was threat matrix by. I'm not going to say the name of the person, but it was Black Lantern Security. But um, it was a really interesting presentation. But he had a slide that is definitely accurate to what the content was about. Because it was all talking about threat matrix. Like, how do you build a threat matrix? And the slide was cause of death. Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and the end result of this great app that looked like it came out of The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, was it produced an Excel spreadsheet that, that had all of the, the craziness for you already in there. It was wild. Uh, th I guess there were two in particular that stood out to me. Um, one was titled Confidently Measuring Attack Technique Coverage by Asking Better Questions That's by uh, Matt Graber um, at Red Canary. Um, so, the, just a couple of bullet points. The whole talk was really about thinking um, or asking the questions, like diving deeper into how could, how could attackers use these techniques to better defend against them. Um, and one thing that he was talking about is, okay, so once you've identified um, a technique, what are the variables within that and what are the things that are uh, more static? So um, the things that they have more control over changing within the technique, that's going to be harder for you to defend against because, I mean, there could be so many permutations of how they might pull that off. Um, so if you can set those aside and identify what are the, what are the required pieces or the, or the static pieces of this attack, because then you can watch for those. So whether those are particular strings within commands, whether those particular um, you know, file types that they might use, and you can then be watching for those more easily um, than watching for those variable parts. Uh, and then there was um, another talk that, as someone who is looking to get into the industry and be an employee for the first time in almost 12 years, um, resumes. I mean, I haven't dealt with a resume in who knows how long. But um, is anyone is anyone even interested in hearing about resumes? Because I'm not going to go through this. Fascinating. <laughs> So um, I won't go through all of these. The, um, by the way, these talks are all 
now on YouTube. Um, so if you go to BesidesPrimo.com, they've got a link to their YouTube channel, and they have all these on there. So, um, but uh, some things that, so this was Stephen Semmel Roth, um, who apparently ran a, a um, InfoSec recruiting firm for some number of years. He doesn't anymore, but it sounds like he had until the last year or two. Um, so he was talking about uh, don't bother with kind of summaries or objectives in a resume that the recruiters don't look at those. Um, he was very much against the functional resume, which is, so the, the typical resume is chronologically. You just have your most recent job to your oldest job. Um, and he does say do that um, while emphasizing skills within that. Because um, there's this other school of thought, which is, oh, do a functional resume and kind of forget the chronology and just talk about what you're interested in or what your what your skills are, what your experience is. And, um, and I have heard that recommended by other people, so it was interesting to see or hear him say, that's just very confusing and recruiters don't want to waste their time trying to figure out. And he said, usually when people are trying to do that, it's because they're trying to hide something. So either they, and, and it's not sort of like a bad thing, right? It could be someone taking off time to raise their kids for a few years and they are now are coming back into the industry or whatever. But because it sometimes can be, you know, you were incarcerated for a certain amount of time or, or whatever, um, that- Best years of my life. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, I got this next tattoo. <laughs> so be because there's the possibility that you might have to hide in something. Um, Hacking stuff. There's the risk of, of that. Is they might take a closer look at it or just say, I'm not going to waste my time with that because it's it's more risky. Is that something that's being seen more now from the, the functional, functional resume? resume thing? I mean, I wasn't familiar with it, but I've not. Yeah, I. it's only been over the last couple of months as I've been looking more into um, the employment side of things and you know what do recruiters look for, what do hiring managers look for, that I've started hearing about functional resume. So I don't know if that's just because I've been unaware um, or if it is a newer thing. So for me, since, I mean, I've never had an IT job, not in IT at all, I'm trying to get in. Um, I have the chronological, so my recent job, what I have now to least recent. Um, and then I try to include Try Hack Me also at the end of that and um, say that I'm putting in my own time outside of work um, and going to school, obviously to try to show that I have at least some experience. Because mm -hmm. that's what a lot of people look for, is they want experience, yeah. but then there's that adage, how do you get experience without having a job? You so, might reverse those. I mean, if your jobs aren't half, put them in there to show you have, you work for places you've taken on responsibility for, but mm -hmm. but maybe put those experiences that you've, you know, self-learning up front. I mean, you still have the job thing, but mm -hmm. just put them out one, of you're on more than one page, but to explain, put front and center what's relevant. Yep. And that's going to be your education. That's going to be what you have been doing. Like, if you definitely want to try to find any creative means that is legitimate of your latest or current job that you can align to the job that you want next. So I might not be in IT, but maybe I do some <laughs> IT-like things. Like, I'm the guy in my department that helps fix the problems that my peer has, or I'm an advanced user that has been doing like process improvements in my role or in my lane. You know, it, it all depends on what you're doing. Yeah. But if you can find that alignment, work that in. That's the best you can do in that position. Bring up to the top. The more relevant stuff. Yeah, yeah. what's relevant. Okay. Um, and like even listing like the, the groups that you're a member of, like ISA and DEF CON 864, I mean, those those carry weight too. Yeah. I mean, I hope Perfect does. <laughs> like for all the jokes I crack in here, I mean, I do really want this to be. I think all of us who are leads emphasize this is something we want to be a cultivation point. Well, I think it, it can also just show that if you're spending your spare time yeah. to investigate this, you're, you're a curious person and you're a person that's going to dig into things. You're not just someone who's just showing up. To, to trade hours and then going on. Yeah, and that was one thing that he brought up as well as kind of those extracurriculars, so the CTFs or the side projects and things. Having that um, in there, you know, no matter how long you've been working in the industry, just kind of shows, yeah, that you're you're going to stay on top of things. You're going to stay um, current. Um, yeah, you have the passion for the field. Um, if you're doing any type of scripting or learning or projects, GitHub or you know yeah. GitLab. Yeah. 
But just like LinkedIn is now a, a normal thing on your resume, like right underneath of that for me is my GitHub, because why not? I'm not a developer by trade, but I do a good bit of scripting just out of my own personal use, and I align it to work too. But it showcases a skill set that I might not put front and center in the right in the words of my resume, but as a whole resource that if the right person were to look at it, they'd be like, holy crap, this dude codes. Yeah. So brand new to LinkedIn, and this might sound like a weird question. Is it normal to have LinkedIn um, URL to a resume? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I just leave off the like HTTPS and stuff and put in with whatever your name slash is. In. I end and then you can customize what you want the last to be. Usually most of them are taken, so if you have a common name, but you might be able to use just your first name. So maybe add one number. I mean, I wouldn't put like your birth year or anything on there. But. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> Did he say anything? Did you mention him not to have like your own? Um, like your mission statement or some of those other things that were at the top. Did he say anything about like um, your pur like the purpose statements, those kind of things? Um, I know he said um, the summer, a summary or objective. Um, are it needed? Well, right. He said they won't read it. Uh, but then later, let's see, he was going it's crazy, through. Because I've heard some people say that's where you put all the keywords. That's where you really <laughs> talk about what you have. And it's, are you writing to the recruiter or are you writing to the hiring manager? So I can tell you, I'm more often than not lately on the resume reading side and have been for a number of years. I want a summary, short, succinct, that describes you. If you have it, great, I'll read it. If it's not there, I'm not going to dot points off of you. But that's your three sentences that I look at where you kind of just describe yourself. You're not even saying, I'm really good at Linux. Like that's not what I'm looking for in those, and that's when I see that and I read that, I'm like, okay, this might not be the person for me because I'm just, I'm reading a glimpse into you but focused on what you're conveying to me. A lot of times, and the reason why I say this too, is cover letters are like 50-50. Mm -hmm. Like, even if I get a cover letter 75% of the time, the potential of it being something worth me reading is more 50% chance it's not worth me reading as opposed to is. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you in the first three sentences whether or not the person took the time to write me, or I got a cookie cutter of what they are sending everybody. Mm -hmm. So your first three, if you got that summary, I'm at least going to read that. And then I'm going to start skimming. And that's what every hiring manager is going to do, skim. I, I think you need to take everything he says similar off with uh, like a grain of salt. So he did a veteran's. Um, webinar and I just thought it was kind of unprofessional. Um, He's drinking a beer on stream while giving like a like professional talk. So I just didn't, uh, a big but, difference. Sorry. Uh, he's like he has an impressive resume. He's a West Point grad and then uh, he served in the army and stuff. But I just um, I think drinking and stuff is on on the to me a recruiter day in and day out is looking at resumes. But he said, I think, was he the one with the tagline? It's like, I've looked at a thousand resumes in a year or something like that. I don't know. I missed the first few uh, minutes of the talk, so he may have said something like that. It was like a ridiculous number, I think. Right. So the how you go to dissect that document is going to be very different based on how often you're doing it. I'm doing it a few times a quarter, around that, maybe. He's doing it a thousand times in a year. So his process of dissecting a resume is probably all about efficiency and having a quick means to be able to say, you're worth my time, you are not worth my time. And that's how he makes his money. That's his job. Mm -hmm. To me, when it lands on my like on my side and ultimately who it's going to land on when it gets past that recruiter to who's going to make an actual decision, they're going to spend a little bit more time. Now granted, they're still going to spend a finite amount of time as to what you put into that resume. That's the reality. But you want to also you want to hit the buzzwords that what a recruiter's going to want, but ultimately have the content that a hiring manager is going to find what they're looking for. And it's different because you're writing to a person. People all want different. You're just exploit getting it, man. I mean, you're like storing it up in there to get past HR, and then you release that second payload yeah. and hit the <laughs> manager on that side. But you can roll dice too, because uh, I've worked in the past with recruiters where I've actually told them, don't you dare touch my resume. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, they'll so the and, mm. you know, and it's like, no, 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 no. But I yeah, they, they, writing those three sentences yeah, is the hardest part yeah. of I, I hate it. Yeah. And now you don't have to do it. I don't have to <laughs> But uh, I was so excited to hear that. I can't <laughs> the skill summary thing is also the same because the advantages are 
the automated scanning, like you're listing out the buzzwords, really, that I don't need to define out in my sentence structure, my bullet points, that here's my programming languages, or here, you know, that's why I keep that in mind, because I don't need to tell you, like, hey, I love PowerShell, or I love Python. I list it there. If it's a talking point, you want to bring it up, then let's talk about it. But I'm not going to have to write a couple sentences to say, yeah, I write this many lines of code, or I've written these things. I don't want to put my time and energy into that, because I'm not going for that job. But I do want to be able to say, like, hey, if you're interested in scripting, most jobs now in security have various degrees of it. It's like, well, now you know where I'm open to talking. And that's why I like the skills, because they hit the automated scanning, and they also give me room for talk. Yeah, just the last couple of things. So he, he did bring up uh, at the beginning of the talk like the four audiences that your resume needs to appeal to to some degree. So there's the, the applicant tracking system. Um, there's the hiring manager. There's the like professional recruiter if you're going to go that route. Um, and then I think the other one was kind of the um, like the frontline HR person or the HR generalist, like someone who's they're they're just probably very inexperienced, they're an entry level person and they're just dealing with, you know, they're just triaging the resumes basically. Um, and each of those three people and then the one system are gonna look at your resume in a different way. And then he also um, had a few slides on different um, books about resume uh, writing and he would go through, okay, um, you know, th should you have this in your resume? Book one says yes, book two says no. And he, he went through, and so, Really, it was like, it all depends on who you ask and who's looking at the resume. I mean, so the grain of salt thing is totally true because, yeah, he can talk about what he prefers to see as a recruiter, um, but, and, and there probably are some just general, you know, things that you can take up, okay, with if the majority are looking for this, okay, but yeah, there's still just so much subjectivity in it based on who's consuming the resume. And the easiest way to bypass that, all of that is to just know somebody and find somebody that you that knows somebody mm -hmm. um, and have their them just put the resume in the hands of the hiring manager. I thought that was that was silly because the networking piece of um, professional life is probably the one that's my least favorite, <laughs> and uh, it it actually paid off this time to somebody that I've never even met, but I added them on LinkedIn, and then um, like her husband's a veteran, and then. So we connected on that level, and then she's like, sure, I'll uh, put your resume in, and sure enough, that's good. To get an internal referral, one, a lot of companies, the person doing the referral gets kicked back if you get hired and you stay on for a certain amount of time, but it gives you a track inside that company where whatever level you have that bond or relationship is a step up, is a level up over the next person that's coming from a recruiter or Apply through the portal. Uh, Chad, do you remember the title of that talk? The one that's resume one? Yeah, the one. Yeah. Resumes about are stupid. Resumes are, yeah, that's but stupid. <laughs> but you still need one. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a great title. Yeah. It was a good talk, too. It was a good talk, I thought. Oh. It was, I thought, one of the better ones that I went to there. Oh. Uh, a couple things. So, Hack the Box was there as, uh, at a booth. I don't remember them in 2019. No, they weren't there. Had a great conversation with them. So they their answer for try hack me is academy. Yeah, I've done a little bit of them. Sweet. Switched to try hack me. So probably because I'm making it. Well, I did that before actually. So I mean, the, some of the assignments that you have, I've already done from the past. Awesome. So it's just screenshots. I'm a huge fan of hack the box. Is it the same price? Is it so it's actually less than that. Like there's some that I think are free, but then there's like an eight dollar a month piece. So you get is it up to the two, you get like two? a credit system, and you get cubes is what they're called. And like the free ones are twenty cubes each, and then after you complete the thing, you get twenty cubes back. So you can keep taking twenty cube. Um, it sounds it sounds like a loop. It sounds like my like <laughs> But you get these little cubes and you can take all 20 cubes, and then they progressively go up to like 40, up to like 300 or 500 cube. Um, so I like that model. I don't know. It's it kind of makes sketch because it's like you get to a point, it's the whole reason you do it in gaming is I want to abstract from you the dollars that you're paying for something right. and put it in a, a completely different scale. 
frame of mind. I don't like well, wait, so they they do something else other than the learning that I'm doing with it. Uh, well, like the gamification of it? Like you get those cues back if you like complete the challenge? Yes, right? so I've only done three ones because I'm cheap and I don't like paying money. But um, you get like a 20 or 40 to start off. You can enroll in paths. Um, it'll give you stuff that you should do based on that path. And then you can take the free courses that are 20, 20 cubes, I want to say. It's been a while since I've been on there. But you'll answer like three or four questions and you get whatever you put into it back. Um, I kind of like that. Yeah, and then eventually you get to a point where I think you get a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. Like once it's they get higher, they kind of start to climb. Yeah, there's got to be partial, but they still get their money. Yeah. So, I mean, you get a little bit back to make it feel like you're not spending as much. <laughs> <laughs> and I did notice, like, even before that, when they did the site redesign, they added that whole starter tier. Yes. You know, inside of the. Yeah. So, what's the main difference between Try Hacking and Hack the Box? And it's just. I think TriHack was more beginner friendly. At least for I me. totally agree with that. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Like if you just, if you just want to learn and have a nice structured walkthrough approach, that's TriHack. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're okay, like doing your own Google research and coming back and trying yeah. something, beating your head against the desk. If you like being thrown in the middle of the uh, ocean with no <laughs> life support, hack the box is good. Or with 50 other drowning people that are like saturating your I love it. <laughs> But they got a good YouTube channel, so you're not on your own yeah, on Hack yeah, the Box. Yeah. If you, you can hit those old boxes that people put content up. And, and they're using the same boxes to try Hack so so it's it's the yeah. European though, right? So it's eight dollars in your euros, but so it equals about eleven something. It's like ten dollars. Yeah. And I I do the VIP subscription, so you don't have the saturated like shared connection where you, somebody's like constantly telling you, "I want to yeah. reboot the box. I want to reboot the box. There must be something wrong with the box." Like that gets. <laughs> you know, that was something that I talked with Insane. Luke about a while back. Was you know we mm -hmm. sat down and it was like calculating you know with the amount of money that try hacking is making the number of users there should be any problem with performance and then you get on there and it's horrible yeah absolutely horrible mm -hmm. so they need to fix that had the Pops does now have a new enterprise tier mm -hmm. which is weird um, in a way but it's like if you're running a pen test company or a team scenario you can have your whole team in there and your boss can have a dashboard which we all want right but <laughs> they must be able to assign boxes and stuff out to people to do they also have um, schools that compete uh, yeah. as well on their We have a team. We need to do something with teams. They did say that, so that I, I compliment them on that Battlegrounds that happened a couple of three months ago or so where you actually got to see Ipsec's face. That's how I felt about that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, John Hammond was the other one. So they've got another one of those coming up October the 22nd. And then there's going to be a university CTF event that's also going to be live streamed on YouTube from them. And I think Ipsec, they said Ipsec and um, John Hammond are going to be the moderators again, too. Nice. Which is kind of cool. I kind of like that eSport aspect. Yeah. You should have given them some flack, though. Because I reached out to them to get sponsors yeah. when we were doing our CTF. And they left us cold. <laughs> they didn't have a car. But they, they didn't have any swag either. They didn't have any swag either. They didn't have any swag either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was the downside this year. It, 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 was pretty much, it was pretty much swagless this year. Red I got a red canary and some shirts. squishy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Did they have any giveaways or any prizes? They had giveaways. Yeah, during the talks. Oh. I gave your wife all my tickets when I was leaving. Oh, yeah, we didn't win anything. That's, that's, that's <laughs> what they were my tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't banking on it. Yeah. Yeah, we checked, but no. Yeah, the the um, swag and the giveaways were a lot less than uh, besides Greenville. Uh, yeah. The last besides Greenville, because um, yeah, I had heard this is the first time that I went to Augusta and I heard like, oh, it's everything's bigger and better than Greenville, and it's now obviously this was a scaled down version because of COVID, and they did mention um, I think in the opening remarks that they actually lost money on besides this year if I if I heard oh, that right. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that was just ticket sales, if there was lack of sponsors, or vendor. what went into yeah, that. Yeah, I think they said sponsors. Yeah. <laughs> it was lack of vendors. It, we were yeah. very, it was very light on vendors. There were only eight 
There weren't many Maybe 10 vendors spread right out. And in 2019, there were probably 35 or 40 mm -hmm. vendors. And some of those vendors were giving out some pretty impressive swag. You know, you drop your business card in the fishbowl, at the end of the day, we'll pull it out and, you know, we'll. We'll give them they were known by drones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, last year, yeah. they, 2019, they had a drone in the raffle, too. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, had a, had a pineapple in the raffle and all that type of stuff yeah. in 2019. This year, they were, they had a couple network taps, and that was about the <laughs> most yeah, impressive electronic taps. stuff like they the, had. The Hack 5 pineapple? Yeah. 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 They had the bash button. And I, they hit a CTF. I didn't go. They did. I didn't yeah, it, was in the, CTF. it was in the fourth area. I never. That's not my thing, so I don't usually do much with it. I miss not having the car. I thought the car in 2019, being able to hack the Lexus and yeah. you know make the doors that and awesome. go up and down and all that good stuff was kind of cool. So, how about for any folks who are going to be such Charlotte? Mm -hmm. I haven't measured them, but it was alright. Anything <laughs> notable? Like any standouts? That was the swag. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was virtual. <laughs> they show you pictures. You're like, check out this. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to send you a picture Free of you one. They still <laughs> send you one of those rope bags that you could wear. I did like that they recorded it previously and just played it during it versus trying to do it live so that then you didn't have technical issues as much. I thought that was a, and they also yeah. streamed it to YouTube, so you could just put it up on what the TV. What did they do first? Huh? What did they, what did they do first? They recorded it first. They rec yeah, first. they recorded yeah. all the talks earlier, so the people oh, who were doing the talk could actually be in the chat room during the talk, mm -hmm. and like, and plus if they had technical issues, they could you know pause yeah. and figure that out. Versus, you know, a lot of times virtual, Saturday you tend to have. <laughs> Next week. My company, we're doing our three days virtual security conference. Are we did the same style? Mm -hmm. So, do all your recordings and then you just hop on and you facilitate chats. And yeah, there was this one lady, and she was just like chatting away. And I was like, man, how is she doing that? Why do you want to talk? It's finally dawned on me. Eye contact with the <laughs> it finally dawned on me. I was like, oh, I bet these are pre recorded. And then something later made that very obvious. Webinar or? We do like a, now we've run a security conference, but like a log con. Most event, like vendors, they do their own like conference, you know, VMware, Splunk, all those. But yeah, log on. Tuesday. I'll send you a link. Okay, yeah. I know that company is yeah. using that software, so you can. I have a talk on there, so you can tune in on awesome. my talk. There you go. <laughs> so plug there, hey. Um, you can get the log this is an hour for work? Yeah. It's, my talk is like 36 minutes. It's, an hour. it's very precise, too. <laughs> well, not 37. Very not 35. I was doing the editing today. That's why it's like fresh in the head. Oh, but it's record. Gotcha. <laughs> kind of on the, the talk side, because Started off with the B sides. Was that those twenty nineteen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ben and I both signed up, and we gave. Are you doing a talk this year, right? Yeah. Math man, teacher and a talker. <laughs> but we did that for twenty nineteen, and what I walked out of that with was, um, if you're going to give talks and go like down that track, get video editing software. Uh, get something like Camtasia or get something that's in that area that's consumer friendly but you know, gives you the utilities. There's open source too. But start using something like that. Put it in your wheelhouse because the skills of just being able to use that like has been invaluable for me. And when I look at everything else, like your peers and everyone else, you're like, no one else is really doing this, but the little touches make the difference, you know. Oh, I had a, a blue, especially you're going pre recorded yeah. stuff. Like, oh, I had one moment in there that was, I brain farted. I can fix that. Or what I did this time was, I was like, oh, it would have been great if I worked a question in right here. All right, cut the frame, extend the frame, bring in so my voice, ask a question. Yeah, and you just, boom. And now you just worked in an element that was previously gapped, you know, missing from that presentation that you could add in. And, I'm hoping to get there before Saturday, but right now the fall. So I'm gonna. I only like demoing live code. So if it can't explode on me, I don't know. 
I don't feel like the risk is worth it. But like I've got a slide at the end of it where it's like, here's the demo slide, and then after it's like, so the demo didn't work. Enjoy these slides. <laughs> I was on a company call, and they're like, so are we doing live or are we doing recorded? And everyone's like, recorded. I'm like, live. And they're like, Heck yeah. Why would you want live? I'm like, fresh. Look, everybody but likes I, watching a real fire. I mean, <laughs> right. I, let me hit like the enter line on my demo, like all my my code. And let's see if it can actually work the one time I need it to. It works every other time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when it's not going to work, it's going to work. Not going to work there. But it's adrenaline. I'll put a big buddy in the code this morning. I had to go to work, and I was like, I've got to fix that. Like, oh, nice. I think another point to add on the video is to have a at least one peer review. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard to catch your own stuff. Goes for your resumes too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't need to be a video. <laughs> <laughs> Be different. It would be different. I don't think it'd yeah. make it through the automated <laughs> systems yeah. that they <laughs> feed in your PDF. <laughs> <laughs> Just name it dot PDF. <laughs> what I want to do is take my resume and make it just an image and then have that in a Word doc. <laughs> so Charlotte was kind of a nothing stood out. I mean, it's been a little while, so I can't. But obviously, that probably indicates that. Uh, um, Anyone else from Eastside Charlotte standouts? A couple of good recordings, moderately good recordings. They're up on YouTube now. Uh, nothing that that makes me want to say you've got to see this right now. Okay. Eastside Greenville. What do we got? Everything. <clears throat> you got to watch it all. So what is what are talks do we have here? We got two speakers. So what do we got from Mr. Report? I'm covering that auto report tool that I started showing. So I've added a boatload of new functionality. Nice. Since then. So it basically is a full doc note taking and documentation suite for pen testing from pre engagement to post engagement, including report writing at the very end, like wrapping that up. Dang. So I incorporated a lot of Luke's feedback and uh, Nick. Cage 710's feedback um, that they had given during the little DEF CON demo that I gave here. But uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm at least going to show it. I wrote code and it kind of works. I remember it was a tool you made. Yeah. Kind of made it kind of worked before, so I imagine it works even a little bit better now. So. And as soon as I'm done with the presentation, it back it all of it. <laughs> it's kind of like drinking a, a pool. <laughs> For those that drink and those that play pool, there's this oh, okay. reality. <laughs> Billions. Yeah, it gets better for a little while, and then it, <laughs> right there's a curve. Then at some point, it becomes a kitchen sink. Once you get the curve, is, yeah, you get the curve. I think software is the same. Like you write more code, it gets better. But once you start writing more code, it gets worse. And at some point, you say, "I'm going to start over and redo this whole thing, make it better from yeah. scratch." Yes, exactly. To introduce all sorts of new bugs. <laughs> Yeah, I'm optimistic. And you're you're speaking. Yeah, mine mine is on getting starting getting started in GRC. I just you know, I know when I came into the industry, that was really the rough spot for me. Is you know you had all these places that would sell you GRC packages, but there really wasn't a hey, how do I how do I get in this space and why do I want to get in the space? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's what my talk is going to be from is you know. Why? why? Why do GRC? You know, defining what it is and explaining kind of, hey, you know, like one of the things that I found was kind of interesting is just a quick search on ZipRecruiter, put in GRC, and it immediately came up with almost 6,000 jobs with a, with a uh, salary range between one hundred and seven and $121,000. Solid. And for the just, audience. Just for putting GRC in, which is kind of, you know, to me, I thought it was kind of amazing that, I know we got There's students there. in various walks of life. Can you summarize GRC? Like it's an acronym, so yeah. So GRC stands for Governance, Risk, Compliance. So just look at that. from my point of view, GRC <laughs> is the plan <laughs> to hack. Okay. The plan is we're looking at it and saying what are the things that we have to protect, and you know what are the things we want to protect, and how do we want to protect them. But really, it's also giving the guidance to the 
people who are protecting us, hey, what have we determined is got the highest risk value, and so that's what you need to put your focus on, being able to protect for us and keep the bad guys from getting to. So I see it as kind of the beginning of the penetration testing and the hack side of it, because you're laying out the Very groundwork good. to then work for or against. You know, from the corporate perspective, I've loved working. So I, I report directly to the head of GRC. And so when it comes to any of the findings that we have on any of our reports, it has immediate connection into the business. Because that risk is now translated. Um, so they help that narration right. for us. Well, that's the thing that's a, that is kind of neat to me about GRC is I can sit down and write up all these wonderful profiles, all these wonderful documents, which the government wants 57,000 documents. Most companies will write them. They'll go out to some third-party company, get their stuff, write it. It'll sit on a shelf. It'll never get tested by anybody. But we're going to say we're compliance because I've got, here's my 67 books. But it's really kind of like your pen testing. You can be a good pen tester this week, but if you don't keep improving your skills, you're slowly going to get worse and worse and worse. And GRC is exactly the same thing. Once I finish writing a policy, I've got to be going back out and looking at the policy and what we're we covering, what has changed, what needs to change because of new threats or new events that are going on. So, you know, it's it's almost the same as pen testing, so I'm just doing it with a bunch of stuff on paper and helping to define what the risks to the organization are. Yes. Wait, that's that's point. Yeah. I just said thank you for explaining. Yeah. And that tying it to the business and ultimately tying it to money, businesses run off money, make no mistakes. Like, Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, no matter how noble, not you know. Except Death County 64, we run off swag. That's right. Yes. That's why we're not a business. That's why nobody likes each other. But whether you're, you know, a professional penetration tester, like you can hack a system, you know, and to you, it's the thrill of, you know, there's a weakness here. Can I find it? Can I exploit it? Can I get in? And once you are, you know, that's the goal. But you write up this report, what's the ultimate goal? Well, to the company that you're doing this for, it's they want to know their risk. They want to know, like, what can you do even when you're not supposed to do it? And anywhere where you can tie things to money, quantify it. Blue teamer or red teamer. Like, say on Luke's side that he got into, you know, a database system and he was able to exfiltrate a set number of records that contain PII. That means in his report, one, he's got quantifiable metrics of what he was able to extract. And if he was so inclined, he could also say, well, here's what that value looks like on you know, the dark market. And also, here are some figures related to what reputation damages typically come with this to you financially, given your business sector with this type of breach. Speaking in their language. Speaking in their language. Because they don't always care about thing that you did that was super cool when you found that one weakness that allowed you to pivot in. You love that stuff. But, and think of it on the blue teamer side too, if you're the defense, it's how can I quantify this? Whether it's a real risk, you know, like, hey, we, we're not patching our systems. We need to patch our systems. And the business is like, oh, we accept the risk. If you can say, hey, you're not patching that system. There's real exploits out in the wild. Here's what's on those systems that have those risks. Did you know that if this were to happen, you're going to lose X? Business will respond differently. Well, and so much is driven now around you're certified. You know, ISO is the big one you hear in so many industries. ISO is just an offshoot of GRC. Even though it might be focused toward manufacturing in some cases, ISO is just another organization that is saying here is how you're compliant you've met these compliancy needs and so you've got this ISO certification the federal government is bringing the CMMC program online and so all of these organizations out there that in the past have had fed contracts in about three years you're going to need to have your organization be CMMC compliant to continue to have your fed contracts so we're going to talk about jobs that are going to start showing up on the market probably in the mid-100s for certified CMMC investigators and auditors mm -hmm. to be able to, these people to keep their Fed contracts, for schools to keep the Fed, Fed research. They're going to have to become CMMC compliant. And they're going to be hiring third-party companies to come in and do this stuff because most of CMMC is a bunch of paperwork, but 
the other half of CMMC is they're going to walk around your campus and they're going to find out, are you teaching and training your people? Um, I have a special place in my heart for it because that's how I entered into this role or into security in general. And, um, and what Eric was saying, I relate to as well because when you have that GRC background, you can write a report that answers exactly why this risk should matter instead of saying, your stuff is broken, go fix it or this is not patched, you should patch it, and just end it at that. While someone with GRC experience can link that to business risk and possibly put a dollar value. So it's it's great experience to have, even though um, there were some mind-numbing moments, many of them, in that. Um, and it's not for everyone. It's more of an administrative, legal type of a role. It's, it's not very technical, which I missed, and I'm glad I'm in a technical role now. Um, but it's a great foundation for security, for anybody who's interested in getting into security. It's, uh, it's a good good study to have as a foundational role. Well, if you're looking for a job to self-employ yourself, oh, shoot, yeah. it's the market to get into because as things advance, every business is going to ultimately need to be able to keep getting insurance from an insurance company. Right. They're going to need to have this documentation, they're going to be have to be able to say, hey, we've identified our risks, here's what our risks are, here's what we're doing to mitigate the risks, here's what we're doing to take care of this problem, that problem, and the other problem, or you're going to find insurance companies not willing to write you an insurance policy anymore. All right, I'm going to have, my uh, battery's about to die, so I'm about to lose internet access, so we probably need to go ahead and call it. <laughs> That's how we call meetings, gentlemen, this is. <laughs> <laughs> so so we just run out of internet access. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks everybody for joining, and we'll see y'all next month. See you everyone. Thanks, guys. And I hope you don't get a laptop one that's like 12-hour batteries. It's gonna make these meetings long. <laughs> <laughs>